Thanks very much for joining us this evening. Uh, my name's Tom Solomon. I'm the International Vice President of the Academy of Medical Sciences. I'm a, a clinician based in Liverpool, but uh, they let me out occasionally. And I've been here, uh, we've had a fantastic day so far already. Um, this morning, uh, we've been doing a scoping workshop on uh, clinical research pathways. And uh, so there's very much an international flavor to our day here. Uh, the, uh, this is the Academy of Medical Sciences and the Lancet International Health Lecture. So for those that don't know, the Academy is the UK's independent voice of biomedical and health research. And our mission is to help create an open and progressive research sector to improve the health of people everywhere. So clearly in the UK, but also internationally. This lecture is a platform for leaders in global health to discuss topics of international significance and to promote discussion. And uh, we've got a fantastic topic for, for this evening. This lecture was established in 2004, but for the last seven years, we've held it jointly with The Lancet, and we're very grateful to The Lancet for support. We have among our uh, guests today, we have people in the room here, we have people online as well. Uh, it's a pleasure to have Julia Gillard, who's the chair of Welcome, uh, who are, it's the Welcome Building, and former Australian Prime Minister. And we're also gonna be joined by the Indian uh, First Secretary, uh, the Economic First Secretary from the Indian High Commission, who she's not quite made it yet, but she'll be joining us soon. Uh, so um, that I think is all the important things I'm meant to tell you. Uh, put your phone to silent if you, uh, if you don't mind. If you're a Twitter type person, there's the hashtag. I think it's called X now, isn't it? And it's not a blue bird anymore, it's an X. So we'll update our slides for next year if it's not changed again by next year, which the way he's managing it at the moment, uh, it wouldn't surprise me if it does change by next year. Anyway, I don't think that was in my briefing. So <laughs> at this point, I probably should hand over to Richard. Thank you. Um, yeah, you're not gonna get your blue tick now. Um, Exactly, exactly. Uh, it's a pleasure to be with you this evening. My name is Richard Horton from The Lancet, and uh, it's a real highlight to uh, co-host this important lecture uh, with the Academy of Medical Sciences. Um, the Academy is the foremost uh, body representing medical science across the United Kingdom. It has had an astonishing this is, I don't know why I'm saying this, you should have said this. Um, it's had an astonishing history, um, having been formed in the, in, in the sort of chronology of academies very recently, and has had a massive impact, uh, not just on medical science in the United Kingdom, but also on policy. Uh, and uh, it's a great honor to be able to partner with the academy in this lecture. But my job is to talk about our wonderful, wonderful speaker, because we are privileged and honored this evening uh, to have with us Professor Cherry Kang, who is the Director of Global Health at the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. Cherry is responsible for leading the brand new team uh, that is executing against three strategic areas, and you might want to make a note of these because we can discuss them in our Q&A at the end if you want. Um, enteric and diarrheal diseases, diagnostics and genomics, as we were talking about before the lecture, one of the most exciting areas, uh, and epidemiology and modeling. In addition to her role at the Gates Foundation, Cherry is professor in the Division of Gastroenterological Sciences at the Christian Medical College in Vellore in India. And there her work explores, not surprisingly, vaccines and public health, with a particular focus on children and infectious diseases in India. Her research has also covered areas such as water sanitation and nutrition. Internationally, her team is one of the most highly recognized multidisciplinary research groups in India. She's also worked for the government of India, leading and building India's very first translation, translational health science institute, and she has served on World Health Organization and Indian vaccine committees, covering areas across policy and science. She's also been a fantastic mentor uh, and guide for women at work and outside of the work. 
The title of her lecture tonight is Successes from the South, the Rotavirus Vaccine Story and Its Lessons. And right at this moment, a PDF should have appeared on the Lancet's website, but you're not allowed to look for it because you're going to hear the real person in the flesh. Please give a warm welcome to Professor Cherry Kang. So hello, and thank you for inviting me here to the Academy of Medical Sciences and to The Lancet. I'm really pleased to be talking to you today about my favorite bug. This is rotavirus, and I think I kind of fell in love with this virus when I first saw the reconstruction that is in the top corner. Uh, it's a triple-layered viral particle. Everybody knows spikes now, but we had them first. <laughs> so, um, you know, when you think about viruses, particularly the ones that affect children, one of the things that you think about is what are the interventions that are available and how are those interventions distributed around the world? So I found it particularly interesting that when Dr. Tedros came to WHO and developed the 13th general program of work, he set these triple billion targets. This was before the pandemic about reaching more people, about improving care and about improving protection. And all of this builds on this understanding that we have, which is your fate is decided at birth. Who you are born to, the home you are born in, the country you are born in, actually decide what opportunities you will have in health, in education, in every opportunity that you might possibly get. So I'm placing this talk in the context of access and equity, and I've structured it in three parts to talk to you about rotavirus disease and vaccine development, then about India and the rotavirus, and then the lessons we have from that. So this will be a picture that's probably familiar to Julia. This is Ruth Bishop. She is the Australian scientist who, with gastroenterology, uh, entrology and pathology colleagues actually found what was originally called the duo virus because it had two layers that you could see on the electron micrograph. Later on, they decided that this was more of a wheel-shaped virus and hence the name rotavirus. She found this virus in the biopsies of children that had acute gastroenteritis, and it was one of the first times that a virus has been, had been associated with, the, with a diarrheal etiology. This came shortly after Al Kapikian, who will also appear in this story, had identified noroviruses in a town called Norwalk in the US using the same catch-all approach of basically taking a stool sample, sticking it under an electron microscope, and then looking to see if there was something that had not been seen before. Now, among Ruth Bishop's colleagues, there was the person who actually did the electron microscopy was Ian Holmes. And shortly after the 1973 discovery of rotavirus in these biopsies, Ian was asked to come to South India, and well, the request went to Ruth, and she passed it on to Ian. So Ian Holmes came to Velo, the small town in which I wound up working, and there was an electron microscope that had been bought by the leprosy mission to look at skin biopsies of patients with leprosy. They used that electron microscope and were able to see that, you know, what was seen in Australia was also seen in India, that the bulk of children that had gastroenteritis actually had the same virus in their stools. 
So once electron microscopy for, uh, was established, a number of other techniques began to be developed, cultures, ELISAs, et cetera, and they advanced our understanding of rotavirus, but it all started with electron micrographs. We now know that rotaviruses are triple-layered particles. Rotavirus, like influenza, has a segmented genome. Influenza has its genes on eight strands. Rotavirus goes one better and has 11. And those 11 gene segments code for 12 proteins, six of which make up the structure of the virus, and six are functional proteins. Now, rotavirus is the commonest cause of dehydrating gastroenteritis in many animal species, including humans. So rotaviruses are known in horses, they've been seen in sheep, rabbits, you name it, you can find rotavirus. But group A rotaviruses are the most common cause of dehydrating gastroenteritis in children. Now, rotavirus is known as a democratic virus because it's a virus that infects everybody without fear or favor. It is a question of when you get the rotavirus infection. So if you live in a very, very hygienic environment, you might acquire your rotavirus a little bit later. If your environment is less clean, then you're likely to get rotavirus earlier. Obviously, as with other viruses, you don't treat it with antibiotics. Every so often, a paper will pop up, including in The Lancet, that says that this antiviral drug really does treat rotavirus. Those papers are usually written by the companies that made that drug. Uh, we do know that oral rehydration therapy is very effective. The problem really is how do you get an acutely dehydrated child to care quickly enough? So if you can give ORS, ORT, that's great. But rotavirus results not only in diarrhea, but also in vomiting. So with vomiting, using oral rehydration is hard. And if you have a child that dehydrates quickly, then finding an IV line for a dehydrated child, especially when they're really small, can become very difficult. So you tend to use scalp veins, you go into the bones, you try to do all kinds of re heroic rehydration. And even then, sometimes it isn't enough. So that's why children die of rotavirus infection. And for these kinds of children that cannot access care, Prevention makes a lot of sense because if you can vaccinate, that happens at a scheduled time. Medical emergencies are much harder to predict. So rotavirus vaccine development started really early after rotavirus had been discovered. There were a lot of approaches that were taken to use human viruses, to use animal-human reassortant viruses, to put animal viruses into humans in what was called the Janarian approach. And there were many candidates that were evaluated in many trials that were done mostly originally in the Northern Hemisphere and usually the Northern parts of the Northern Hemisphere. The first vaccine that was licensed actually came from research that was done by Al Kapikin, a real giant in the field of viral gastroenteritis, the discoverer of Norwalk virus. He had worked on this virus for a really long time. He took a monkey virus, the rhesus rotavirus, combined it with human viruses to create what was then known as RRV, the rhesus reassortant rotavirus vaccine. This vaccine was evaluated in about 10,000 children. It, all the phase three studies done in the US made by Wyatt, and it was introduced into the US immunization program in the same year that it had been licensed, 1998. Now, at the time that the vaccine was introduced into the program, I'd just like to make the point 
that the vaccine was introduced in the US. You can see where the deaths due to rotavirus were occurring. Now, why would you take a vaccine that solves a problem for which children don't die in the US and put it there when the problem is really in developing countries? Well, you don't have children that are hospitalized, you know, your parents can continue to go to work. There were a lot of economic assessments that were done that said rotavirus vaccine was a good investment for the US as well because it pre prevented morbidity, even if it wasn't required to prevent mortality. So this was the vaccine, the rhesus rotavirus vaccine. Uh, it gave 95% protection against severe gastroenteritis in the phase three trials that were done. But I'd like you to focus on the graph that is in the top corner. Ab after about one and a half million doses of this vaccine had been given, the BEARS system, which is a passive reporting system for adverse events associated with vaccines, identified a possible association with intersusception. So this telescoping of the gut can be, a, it's a very common pediatric emergency, happens to children all the time, had been happening before rotavirus vaccines were introduced, but there was an association seen with cases really peaking in the first week after the first dose of rotavirus vaccine was given. So if you can see that figure up there, that is first, second, and third doses in that order. And you can see that there is a big peak after the first dose, a small one after the second dose, and you don't really see anything after the third dose. So this vaccine was withdrawn, and then people began to think about, should we make another rotavirus vaccine? Is this something that we're going to see with all rotavirus vaccines? There were a lot of discussions at WHO that said, this vaccine will save lives in the developing world. Why aren't we taking it there? And then there was pushback from developing country representatives that said, well, you know, if you have a vaccine that's not used in the US, you cannot push it onto developing countries to use. So two vaccines wound up being developed just eight years later. These were made by GSK and Merck. They were published back to back in the first issue of NEJM in 2006. They each had done trials in 60 to 70,000 infants. These trials had to be that large to assess a risk of intersusception that was at least as much as um, with the Rotashield vaccine. And when these vaccines were introduced into the program, it cost 200 US dollars to immunize one child. These vaccines were introduced in the private market in India two years later. The cost was a lot less. At that time, it was a mere $40 a dose for the vaccine. I did a calculation at the time to figure out that if we had to pay that price for the vaccine to be introduced into the Indian program, I realized we would wipe out half of India's health budget on one intervention just for children. So no babies being born, no hospitals running within the government system. Now these vaccines were tremendously effective vaccines. They had the Rotarix vaccine by GSK had 85% efficacy against hospitalized rotavirus gastroenteritis. It was based on a human strain, a monovalent one, and you could give two doses. And the Rotatech, which was the Merck vaccine, had about 96% efficacy against hospitalized rotavirus gastroenteritis. It was a pentavalent vaccine, a bovine human reassortant, unlike the rhesus reassortant of Rotashield, and this required three doses. So moving from the state of the world then to what happened in India. Now, I've shown you diarrheal deaths, but in India in 2005, we started a program 
that looked at rotavirus surveillance using standardized methods across the country. We built a network and we started to look at hospitalized gastroenteritis and found that we had thought that rotavirus was about 20% of all diarrhea, but when you used a systematic approach, you actually found that the contribution of rotavirus was much greater. It was almost two in five hospitalized children having rotavirus in their stool. I was doing a lot of studies at the time in the community around the country, et cetera, and we were able to put all of that data together to build a disease burden pyramid, essentially calculating for a birth cohort in India, which was 27 million in 2011. It essentially meant that one in two children would have a rotavirus gastroenteritis, one in eight children would require an outpatient visit, one in 30 children would be hospitalized because of rotavirus, and one in 650 children in India would die of a rotavirus gastroenteritis. So given our disease burden, clearly we needed a vaccine. But there was Rotorix, there was Rotatec, monovalent, animal, human, reassortant, which one should we use? Would it work in India? Because we'd had a bad experience with polio vaccines where oral vaccines work brilliantly in high-income countries and then didn't work so well in developing countries. And then the really big question, birth cohort 27 million, what vaccine can we afford to have? So Rotashield had been produced uh, under a license from the National Institutes of Health. And in India, we had a program with the National Institutes of Health, which was called an Indo-US Vaccine Action Program, which had been in existence since 1987. It was money that was left over from the US under public law 480, where India was supposed to pay for the wheat that the US had shipped in the 1960s, and then they couldn't repatriate the money in rupees, so they said, okay, spend it on vaccines. Best investment the US government ever made. So um, at the time, there were basically three large groups in India that were working on enteric diseases. And one of those groups was in Velo, where I was based, and the other one in Delhi, which uh, where Dr. M. K. Bhan uh, was a pediatrician and he had received from WHO some of the very first ELISA kits that had been made. And he needed access to stool samples. So he went to the neonatal nursery where you have children, collected stool samples and started testing them and found that a lot of the children were asymptomatically infected with rotavirus. Now, this was a finding that Ruth Bishop had also described from Melbourne, and it had been seen in South America and a few other places, but it seems very geographically restricted and strain restricted, some strains in some places. So Dr. Bhan identified that kids were infected with this, and he tried to characterize the strain, but unusually, he also followed up those children and found that children who had been neonatally infected actually had fewer attacks of rotavirus diarrhea in the follow-up period than kids who had not acquired this infection. So this meant that this could be a virus where an infection or exposure could protect you from subsequent disease, and it was decided to develop this as a vaccine candidate. In Bangalore, at the Indian Institute of Science, C. Durga Rao, who was um, a scientist, was also looking at another strain. And this strain was called I321. It was also a bovine human reassortant strain that had been identified. He did a similar study a little bit later, also following up children who had had this infection and showed that kids who had had the infection appeared to be protected from both infection and diarrhea during follow-up. So we had two neonatal infections that could potentially be used as vaccine candidates. 
So Dr. Bhan was in Calcutta attending a meeting when he bumped into Roger Glass. Now Roger Glass was a scientist who was then working in Bangladesh. They decided to have a drink together, got talking and said, we're going to work together and wound up collaborating under the Indo-US Vaccine Action Program for the next 25 years. So this program supported strain characterization in the US and India, and both of the strains were taken forward. And it was hypothesized at that time that because human rotaviruses, the common human rotaviruses, had a spike protein that was either P4, P8, sometimes P6, if you had a spike protein that was P11, in general, mothers wouldn't have antibodies to that, and therefore the neonatal strain would be able to replicate well in children. So I'm not going to walk you through all the text on these slides. It's just to show you that under the Indo-US Vaccine Action Program, established in 1987, a lot of work had to be done both in India and in the US. So the strain had to be adapted to culture in a cell line that could be used for vaccine production. Sounds simple, but it isn't really. So they made pilot lots with the strain. Then they went into phase one trials in US adults. And this is something that the NIH supports, which is absolutely brilliant. Vaccine testing and evaluation units that are a network of laboratories that are funded by the NIH, where you can take your early stage products for evaluation. So the VTEU in Cincinnati did a trial in US adults, and they found, you know, adults have lots of exposure to rotavirus, so it wasn't really surprising that only two of the subjects actually had an increase in antibodies, and of those two out of 10 subjects that had that increase in antibodies, both of them had received the 116C or the Delhi strain of rotavirus. Then they went into phase one studies in children. And what they found here was that four out of 10 children that had received 116E zero converted, none of the ones that received I321. And you know, it seemed clear that there was a difference, even though both were neonatal strains, there seemed to be a difference between the two strains. Now, four kids zero converting is relatively low. The vaccine was then under the Indo-US Vaccine Action Program, brought back to India and given to a very new company called Bharat Biotech. And they were asked to produce the lots of vaccine that would then go into further clinical trials. So then they did a phase 2A in India, one dose of the vaccine. And just to point out that zero conversion rates in kids that received 116E was 73% as opposed to 40% in the US children, 39% in the ones who received I321, but the placebo recipients had a 20% zero conversion. So that just goes to show you, kids in India have a lot of exposure to rotavirus in early life, which is not something that you would see in the US. So then they did a dose ranging study and they decided to take only 116E forward for that and essentially showed that you could get really high zero conversion rates and that there was a dose response. You give more virus, you get a better immune response. So then we come to India's very first phase three study for a product that was a novel product being developed in India. Now at this time, we're talking now about 2008, there are vaccines that are licensed in India. Rotorix and Merck have come into India and are available in the private market. The Indian Academy of Pediatrics is recommending this vaccine. Can we do a placebo controlled trial? So we had a consultation to decide whether we could do a placebo control trial or not. And Peter was part of the consultation group and 
essentially it was decided that placebo controls could be efficacious in some situations. When you're developing a locally affordable vaccine, when you're evaluating local safety and efficacy of an existing vaccine, when you're testing a new vaccine where uh, an existing vaccine is not considered appropriate, and sometimes if you're looking at local burden of disease. So this phase three efficacy study was done across three sites, and because it was a placebo controlled trial, we were asked to look after these children as carefully as we possibly could for the entire period of two years. So at that time, mobile phones were new. Every family got a mobile phone. The study staff uh, numbers were on the phones. We contacted the kids at least weekly, sometimes more often than that. Every illness was managed by the study team. So we did you know, cardiac surgeries, hernias, you name it, accidents. We were looking after the kids all of the time. Physicians were available, including for home visits around the clock. And all of the costs were covered by the study team. We wound up with a trial that had less than 2% losses to follow up at the end of two years. And we wound up with uh, efficacy of 55%. The vaccine was licensed by the Indian regulatory authorities in 2014, and it was priced at one US dollar a dose for public markets. So the question then is 85% for Rotorix, 96% for Merck, 55% for an Indian vaccine. And we had also been doing studies at the time to see whether natural infections to rotavir with rotavirus could protect from disease. And we did this cohort study for a really long time. And the best we could get to was that if you had three rotavirus infections, it would result in about 80% protection against moderate to severe diarrhea. This was deeply, deeply, deeply disappointing. And that was because actually all rotavirus vaccines had been predicated on this birth cohort study, which was done in Mexico, that showed that if you had two prior rotavirus infections, circled in red here for your attention, two prior rotavirus infections gave you perfect protection against moderate to severe rotavirus diarrhea. That's what the entire idea of oral rotavirus exposures giving you protection from disease was about. So to get 100% with two in Mexico and to barely get to 80%, 57% in India with two exposures, 79% with three exposures was disappointing. We did a modeling study to try and predict what this would mean and where we wound up was that Essentially, we predicted somewhere between 45 and 50% protection in our setting based on the data that we had generated from our community. So 55% was pretty good. Now, what does lower efficacy in developing countries mean? There have been a number of studies that have been done with other vaccines in Asia and Africa. And I'm just going to walk you through let's say the Bangladesh and Vietnam figure. So in Bangladesh, you have 46% vaccine efficacy. In Vietnam, you have 72% vaccine efficacy. But in Bangladesh, you actually have an incidence that is 9.1. So a 46% efficacy drops you down to an incidence of 4.9 per 100 child years of follow-up. So you've actually prevented four episodes of rotavirus gastroenteritis. If you look at Vietnam, 72% efficacy, but your incidence of disease is much lower at 2.8. So even if you have 72% efficacy, you're dropping down to 0.8, which means you've only prevented two episodes per 100 child years of follow-up. So you get double the benefit in Bangladesh, even though the vaccine efficacy is much lower. 
And the same thing shows up with the Rotatec vaccine studies in, sorry, with the Rotatec studies in Africa. So we took all of this data and some costing data as well, went to the National Technical Advisory Group on Immunizations. They ask you the questions, is there disease burden? Is the disease a priority? Do you need it in the National Health Plan? Is it recommended by WHO? Would use of the vaccine promote equity? Well, the answer is yes to all of those. So rotavirus vaccine use was recommended and accepted in 2015, but we weren't quite done yet because we evaluated a vaccine that was a lyophilized product and the company had made it to fit in the OPV space in the freezer. And the program turned around and said, that's not what we want. The volume is too large. We can't have so much buffer. So we had to urgently conduct a study without the buffer we showed that there was no difference in immunogenicity. We had to go to the regulator for a labeling change. And finally, we had a product that the program was willing to accept. So in 2016, the vaccine was introduced for 9% of the birth cohort. Then we had another four states, and then we had UP, which is a state that has more than 200 million people. So that got us to about 45% by the end of 2018. And by the end of 2019, all of India's birth cohort, which has now shrunk to about 25 million, was covered with rotavirus vaccine. So there were other vaccines that were also developed. Serum Institute of India began to work with the NIH bovine human reassortant strain. They had licensed it in 2005, but they didn't take it up seriously for about half a dozen years after that. They did clinical testing of the vaccine. The vaccine had about 42% efficacy, but at the same time that they were doing a trial in 7,500 infants in India, uh, MSF decided that they were going to test the same vaccine in Niger. And in Niger, the vaccine had 67% efficacy. So this was in the news. This result actually came out well before the Indian trial was completed because in Niger, they stopped the study early when they got the number of cases that they were looking for. There were two other companies, nobody ever talks about this, but there were two other companies also developing rotavirus vaccines in India. Shanta Biotechnics actually had a head start on serum. They did phase one, phase two studies, and in their phase two, they did a comparison with uh, Rotatec, the Merck vaccine, which is also a bovine human reassortant, and they were able to show that their vaccine had 83% immunogenicity, whereas Merck had 63%. So they decided to be really ambitious and go for a phase three that was an immunogenicity, non-inferiority, and they set their uh, non-inferiority at 10. They had 20% and they set it at 10. Where they landed was at 14, so they actually failed. Shanta was then bought so it's not a bad vaccine, it just didn't meet the non-inferiority margin. Shanta was bought by Sanofi Pasteur and the vaccine program was halted. Hilleman Labs, which is a joint venture between the Wellcome Trust and Merck, um, was supposed to develop a heat stable version of the Rotatec vaccine. They did phase one studies and they had really good stability data but then a decision was made to halt that program as well in 2018, because by that stage, it was clear that across Serum and uh, Bharat Biotech, much of the market had been taken up already. So coming finally to lessons and the context for access to vaccines, I'm just showing you here vaccine introduction in the UK and India. So measles in the UK was introduced in 1968. It resulted in an almost 100% reduction till you forgot about using the measles vaccine. But um, in India in 1986, 
the Hib vaccine was introduced in the UK in 1992, in India in 2009, pneumococcal 2006, and in India finally only in 2020. And we know that when these vaccines are used, they actually result in significant reductions in disease. But unfortunately, mostly in developing countries, we don't do that last part of this figure, which is measuring the impact of vaccines once they are in the program. So today, where are we with rotavirus vaccines? Uh, in 2018, the two Indian rotavirus vaccines were pre-qualified. In 2023, I'm really happy to be able to say this, 74% of Gavi needs are met by Indian manufacturers. That's a big change. A lot of countries have switched from multinational products now to the Indian manufacturers. How did this happen? It happened because of Gavi. Gavi was founded in 2000 to address vaccine inequity. It's been through a number of phases. Gavi is a whole separate amazing story. We can have problems with Gavi in some ways, but they've done good stuff, especially if you're from a developing country. So a billion children immunized since 2000. If you look at what they have done in terms of getting vaccines out to children, they've been absolutely amazing. And rotavirus is a big part of what they've done. Now, as I mentioned, 74% of rotavirus supply this year is from developing country vaccine manufacturers. So I'd just like to do, introduce this figure to you. This is percentage of countries that have introduced new vaccines by current Gavi vaccine eligibility from 2006. So in the solid lines, high-income countries, non-GAVI countries. Let's go over the orange figures first. So what you can see here is orange solid line, orange dotted line. You've got GAVI countries that have a higher rate of coverage. More GAVI countries have PCV than non-GAVI countries. You look at rotavirus, you see the same picture in the blue. There are now, as a proportion, more rotavirus using Gavi countries than non-Gavi countries. That's not true of HPV yet, but HPV is not yet provided to Gavi by a developing country vaccine manufacturer. So I'll make the case that when that happens, that's going to change too. So if we look at diarrheal disease deaths in 1990, before all these programs started to where we are in 2019, which is the last global burden of disease estimates, you can see I pointed out the dark blue in the US where vaccines were first introduced. The rich world is still the rich world. Children still don't die of rotavirus there, but it's so nice to see the colors change in South Asia and Sub-Saharan Africa. This has been, it's not all vaccines. There are secular changes taking place as well, but vaccines contribute a lot to the decline in deaths in these countries. So what are the lessons learned? It takes a long time, 1985, since the, vaccine, since the virus that became a vaccine was identified. It takes a team, lots of players from all over the world came together. It takes capacity, it takes engagement, it takes investment. And problem solving only comes through living through the problems. Whether that is clinical research or it is vaccine manufacturing, you need the experience to really be able to learn. Now, in India, of course, clinical research is, uh, you know, we are all guinea pigs. I personally like the idea of being a guinea pig, but our media doesn't appreciate that so much. So they've constantly been um, talking to us about why 
we aren't uh, doing enough about safety monitoring, why we are not, why we are doing certain kinds of research, why we aren't doing other kinds of research as well. And our regulators are very responsive to what the media says, as are the courts. So in 2013, for example, the Supreme Court cut, shut down all clinical trials in the country until we had a reform of the clinical trial regulations. So doing impact assessment, I think, is a key part of providing to the community the data that allows them to understand both the value of vaccines and the safety of vaccines. So we set up a network to do impact assessment in India, and this is what happens when you introduce rotavirus vaccines. Rotavirus is a very seasonal virus. You see a lot of it in the winters. You can see here as the vaccine coverage goes up in the dotted line, the proportion of rotavirus positivity in the solid blue line comes down. And we also looked at safety because 6,800 children wasn't enough to give you a safety signal. So we did one of the largest ever studies of intersusception. And essentially, if you look at the cases of intersusception here after dose one, dose two, and dose three, you can see that there is no real peaking of intersusception cases as was seen so clearly in the US in the first week after the first dose. There's none of that here. So India's place in the world existed pre-COVID-19. 60% of the world's vaccines were procured by the, that were procured by the Gavi Alliance came from India. It was not high value. It was certainly high volume. So what happened with COVID-19? Well, we gave out 2.2 billion doses of vaccine and we made them all ourselves. So we did not import any vaccines and we are the only country in the world that had every platform, including DNA vaccines, that were evaluated in a full phase three efficacy study. So we wound up with four pre-qualified vaccines, Covaxin for some time, Covishield, Covavax, and the J&J adenovirus vectored vaccine that was also made by an Indian manufacturer, but for export only. There were also vaccines that were not WHO pre-qualified, so a nasal vaccine, the DNA vaccine, and an Indian mRNA vaccine all made at between four and 14 US dollars a dose. And you talk to the vaccine manufacturers, they made a profit on that. So just to end, you know, I come from a small town in Southern India, but I've had great partnerships all around the world, including some people who are here in the room, wouldn't have been able to do all of this alone. They, is a team in Velo, there is a team outside Velo, but I think what really matters is why we do this work. Thank you very much. Okay, so now stay in your seats because we're going to have three commentaries on um, Professor Kang's talk, and so I'm going to introduce our, our three speakers. Um, Mirren, come up. Yes, thank you. Um, let me introduce them uh, one at a time. So Professor Mirren Teresa Gamara is head of research at GSK Vaccines, uh, and she is a virologist with a special interest in gastrointestinal infections and vaccines against diarrheal disease, and not surprisingly, in particular, rotavirus disease prevention. So, Professor Gamara, why don't you go first? Thank you very much, Richard. And thank you, Terry, for a wonderful talk. Although, I, as you know, I'm a great fan of rotavirus as well, is, and, and I've been working on rotavirus for a number of years. It's great to see the whole history put together, and particularly, uh, from the country where the impact has been greatest. Um, 
I just want to clarify that I am a head of research of uh, GSK's uh, Global Vaccines uh, Institute in Siena. Tonight, I'm just talking in my personal capacity. I am not representing GSK. I think the story that Charlie has told us clearly shows what can happen when there is a need, when there is um, expertise in a country, collaboration, international collaboration, and capacity uh, to build uh, manufacturing in the country. How can it, can it can impact in the country itself and beyond? What is astonishing to me is how you shown the rotavirus uh, vaccine story, and it was one platform. It has made a huge impact, but now move on to COVID, and you have managed in India to produce vaccines in every single platform. And that for me is a hugely important lesson, and I will come back to that again. Um, clearly, the success has been built on large volume and uh, inexpensive pricing. And that has been instrumental for a country like India that has an enormous fifth cohort, but also for Gavi countries. Uh, and as you rightly said, more than 60% of the, of the Gavi uh, vaccines are now produced uh, in India. Most of these Gavi countries uh, still uh, are located in one region of the world in Africa. And Africa is still totally dependent on external vaccine manufacturing now mostly from India. Uh, there are a number of, of vaccine manufacturers, so there are some risks in the market. But let's try to think in the future, should the economic situation change in countries? Is this model of low cost, high volume sustainable? It may be sustainable for India and the region with a high birth cohort. But as the difference uh, economic, in economic terms between different ranges may continue to widen, is that going to be a challenge? And I know, uh, of course, WHO uh, has this wonderful initiative to create uh, local hubs or regional hubs in Africa. And I think there's a step in the right direction. Inequity can only be solved if we have local manufacturing. What I am worried about and what I'm concerned about and would like to know other people's opinion is why are we focusing on a technology, on a specific technology? Most of the effort for vaccine manufacturing in Africa is based on mRNA. And let's be honest about it, we only have one mRNA vaccine that works for infectious diseases, and that's COVID. There are many problems still with mRNA vaccines. The cost of goods remains a huge issue. The stability remains a really big problem. Some of these problems will be solved, but they will continue to carry the IP issues that the whole field is riddled with. So should we be thinking and learning from the Indian experience and diversify the vaccine manufacturing in Africa? And like we have done in academic science, uh, this, uh, what is the role of India in the South-South collaboration and <coughs> assisting uh, the African continent in developing their own vaccine manufacturing capacity that is diverse and that doesn't have a single technology and that is not so dependent on this north to south collaboration that has been happening for a long time. And that's what I would like to say. Fantastic. Right Thank you very much. <laughs> well, you teed up our next speaker brilliantly um, <laughs> because Professor Petro Tablanche uh, has played an absolutely key part in designing and implementing South Africa's biotechnology strategy. She's currently Managing Director of Afrogen Biologics, um, based in Cape Town. Uh, Afrogen hosts the global mRNA technology vaccine hub under the COVAX initiative uh, and has an mRNA COVID vaccine candidate in development as part of her program to build capacity. Um, so, Petro, over to you, and we can see you perfectly on video. Welcome. Good evening, and thank you very, very much for the opportunity to, to contribute and to listen to, to Professor Kang's uh, uh, presentation. If I may, um, Richard, just make one or two comments on this presentation, which is a beautiful story, but with so, so much learning. 
The first comment that, that I want to make is indeed, let's commend India on its ability to be self-sufficient, on its ability to be end-to-end, -to, -end, to be able to conduct research and development and to be contributing also to vaccine supply on the continent that, that I represent. I am. Um, I just want to remind us: if we do an analysis of where vaccines are being produced um, by value, seventy-six percent of the value of all global vaccine production sits in four companies in the high-income income world. And if we look at by volume, seventy-three percent of all vaccines produced by volume are produced by developing countries, and Africa only producing one percent. The other comment that I want to make, um, and, and therefore the case for due diversification of manufacturing in a careful way is, is quite important. The second point that I want to make is the story of rotavirus. In 1998, a vaccine that me met the requirements um, in clinical development to be introduced in the US. Should we not very early and proven 20 years later or 15 years later to be actually probably quite safe for introduction in low and middle income countries, particularly Africa, where the death rate is highest. Shouldn't we perform the full vaccine value assessment early on with a view of the target product profile for the people that is mostly affected about that? And I leave that as a, as a, as a discussion, but I wanna circle back to mRNA. So what Africa needs is more than one platform. But with mRNA, the motivation here is, it is a platform that leans itself towards therapeutics, agricultural applications and vaccines. So if you want to empower and create a hub in a model which is a multilateral transfer, mRNA brings that opportunity of multi-purpose, multi-product. The second point, cost of goods is a challenge, but already there's new technology that even here in South Africa and Cape Town, Afrigen with partners are introducing why we are building the platform and transfer it to 15 um, countries in, in low middle income countries representing more than 3 billion people. Looking at continuous processes for the manufacturing of, of mRNA vaccines, conscious of the importance to get to $2 a dose or below that. So that work is ongoing and the data already starting to demonstrate that. The important point made around thermostability, are we developing a vaccine with a target product profile aiming for a population or an environment with special challenges without being conscious of the qualities of this vaccine. So very, very important, already starting to work with partners across the globe to look at a thermostable vaccine, mRNA vaccine, that can be introduced in the conventional healthcare systems that supports um, the, the need where these vaccines need to go. And the third point that I want to make, very important, yes, we actually only have one registered product as a vaccine for mRNA. There's a rich pipeline developing. And if you look at all the products being developed now for mRNA, 27% are vaccines. The others are all therapeutics and metabolic disorders and cancer. But in the 27%, there's a rich pipeline moving towards registration. And again, for sustainability, the mRNA hub here in Cape Town, WHO, enabled and empowered, is, has already started developing vaccine candidates that is suitable for mRNA applications and in our quest for sustainability. And these are tuberculosis, early preclinical work already there. Gonorrhea, innovative vaccine addressing uh, burden of disease. Rift Valley Fever, eradicating Rift Valley Fever through a vaccine that will address both humans and the bovine applications for uh, veterinary applications. And of course, HIV uh, working with, with, with a large global consortium. So there is, there is a need for us globally to be conscious of where the vaccines are made and where the vaccine R&D is conducted, that it is suitable and customized for where the need is, where it needs to fulfill an unmet need. 
The other comment that I want to make is, is with, with, with the importance of science. And I've listened to Professor Kang's presentation and right through it, what came across was science, the importance of science and collaboration and partnerships. And the case study here in South Africa in November 2021, when the teams in South Africa finally learned that we will not receive a technology donor, that we are, we are on our own. Thanks to the scientists and the quest for information, for learning, and no fear of discovery, to go where no one's been before. And that is so important. Um, if we want to build vaccine pipelines and develop vaccines, that will end up in developing countries, in the homes and in the in the arms and in, of people that needs it most. Um, those are contributions from me, and thank you very much again for the opportunity to comment. Thank you very much, <laughs> thank you very much Petra. And that's um, as you'll see in the uh, paper that we published online from Professor Kang. She draws four specific lessons from the rotavirus vaccine story and perhaps that's a fifth lesson about science as well so thank you very much and our third speaker professor suri moon it's a great pleasure to introduce you suri you are co-director of the global health center at the geneva graduate institute which has become an absolute central forum convening people in geneva for the launch of multiple projects and we've been very privileged to launch one or two of our um, commissions with Suri. She is a professor of practice, interdisciplinary programs and in international relations and political mm -hmm. science. And Suri's goal is to combine her academically rigorous research with policy development, which she does with exquisite success. Suri, the floor is yours and we can see you and your slides. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Richard, for the warm um, introduction. And thank you very much uh, to the organizers for the invitation to be here. It's a great honor not only to be asked to comment on Professor Kang's uh, amazing and, and really wide ranging keynote lecture, but to be on a panel with really uh, such accomplished women on an all female um, event. Uh, uh, in many ways. So so thanks very much. My, my great pleasure to be here. Um, I wanted to focus my comments on uh, what I saw in, in the rotavirus story and what we've also just heard now from uh, Dr. Terblanche as very much a story of alternative innovation models. Um, and I wanted to kind of zoom out a little bit in my comments on Dr. Kang's lecture to look at um, the, the aspects of the, the model uh, of pharmaceutical development models that, that are alternative, that can be alternative, and what this might um, mean for global public health in the future. What are some possibilities and, and prospects? Uh, so there are really just three main comments that I would like to offer, and, and I really look forward to further discussion with, with all of you. Uh, and the first is that uh, the story of the rotavirus vaccine is an inspiring one, and it um, emerges against a background of rapidly growing capacity. And since COVID-19, I would say rapidly growing political interest in research and development in developing countries and strengthening uh, and expanding that capacity. Uh, COVID-19 gave a turbo boost, I would say, to efforts that were already underway. Uh, I think it's not widely known how many of the uh, vaccines for COVID were not only developed in uh, lower and middle income countries, but the, the candidates, actually the, the number of candidates uh, were quite high. And so you can see here the total number of candidates that were preclinical uh, clinical as of 2022, and about half uh, in high income countries, uh, about 40% in low and middle income countries, and about 6%, as you can see, in, in a uh, collaborative uh, project. If you look on the right-hand side of my screen, you can see where did clinical trials happen? So of course, R&D is not just the preclinical work, but the, the human bodies, as we've just heard, who uh, um, the, the people who volunteer to um, to be guinea pigs, whether <laughs> whether the media or the regulator likes that term. Uh, and here you can see that so many people in so many different parts of the world contributed to the rapid development of COVID-19 vaccines. Um, but this was COVID. Even prior to COVID, we did see a really rapidly increasing uh, capacity. And one indicator, this is just one, is the number of clinical trials uh, in low and middle income countries. What you can see here is that if you look back in to the year 2000, you only had about 5% of trials happening in low and middle income countries. By 2020, that proportion had increased to 28%. 
And so, of course, you still have the majority of the trials happening in high income countries, that's in blue. But the growth, I think, has been absolutely phenomenal in low and middle income countries. And I think this is something that we uh, perhaps don't pay enough attention to. I should also flag, it's not shown on the slide, but I should also flag that the number of the and the proportion of uh, phase one trials uh, and phase two trials, the higher risk trials, has also been growing in a number of LMICs. So this is not only phase three uh, for example, or phase four, we do see that kind of movement up the um, uh, the value, you know, up the the value chain to the riskier, scientifically riskier phases of R and D. And so, I think this actually sets the stage and sets the groundwork for thinking about how can R&D be done differently, taking advantage of this growing capacity so that we better meet public health needs. When we think about some of the features that we just heard Dr. Ter Blanche describe, that we just heard Dr. Kang describe, products that are developed to be affordable by design, to be usable in the context where they're needed, whether that means thermal stability or perhaps um, you know, not needing a, a needle for injection. Uh, products that are developed to target relevant strains to actually meet public Public health needs on the ground in the countries or contexts where they're needed, and collaborative R&D models that actually take advantage of knowledge coming from multiple um, parts of the world that offers the ability to make science move faster, to have better quality science, uh, and of course to build capacity for the future. So these are all features of alternative innovation models that I think are interesting that we've just seen illustrated now, and the question is can that be scaled up? So one of the questions that's come up in the, the chat actually here on, on Zoom is uh, whether for pandemic products, can we, uh, do we see new arrangements coming into place to make sure pandemic products are more equitably uh, accessible uh, during, uh, before even during pandemics. And um, I'm afraid to say from reporting here from Geneva that um, it's a bit worrying, the, the current picture. So of course we are in the middle of negotiations for a, a pandemic accord or a pandemic treaty. And in some ways, we can look at this as not just an accord about pandemic products, which is important, but also a litmus test on how much willingness is there for countries to cooperate internationally on health technology R&D to better meet public health needs. And if it is a litmus test, it is a worrying one. Um, and let me just give you a couple. Uh, updates. We have uh, indeed many, many countries engaged. Here's a picture from the negotiations that wrapped up just a couple of weeks ago. We're starting up again uh, next week. Uh, but those countries have had a very hard time coming to agreement even on pandemic products. So recall that the treaty negotiations are only focusing on what are called pandemic products. And actually, we're talking about a very, very small piece of the broader R&D ecosystem, about 1%, depending on how you count, less than 1% or 1%. These are figures from pre-COVID, but I think more representative than what we actually saw uh, during COVID. So it's a relatively small piece of the puzzle. And it's a piece of the puzzle that is quite special. It doesn't operate the way the rest of the R&D system operates. Uh, what you have is a much more um, intensive and extensive public sector role. You can see that in my slide here. You can look at funding for emerging infectious disease R&D, and that orange line is the funding that's coming from, uh, from the public sector. Now, this makes perfect sense. This is how uh, pandemic R&D should logically be funded, because in interpandemic times, when we're not in the middle of a pandemic, Nobody knows if we'll have one, when we'll have one, and how much of a product uh, will ultimately be needed. So it's a very, very high risk area where it absolutely makes sense for governments to invest. But in an area that is such a specialized part of the R&D system, where it's primarily public money that is paying for the R&D, de-risking and facilitating it, still governments are not able to agree on um, one of the most difficult issues currently in the pandemic treaty is anything. First of all, it's anything having to do with pandemic products. But secondly, one of the big sticking points is technology transfer. So governments have been very very um, hesitant, perhaps even unwilling, to uh, commit to transfer technology to try to facilitate 
the kinds of R&D and the rapid uh, access to products that would be needed. Um, and the reasons for this, I think, are twofold. One links back to my previous point. With growing R&D capacity in a number of developing countries, there is a new competitive dynamic between countries because, of course, pharmaceuticals are a big business uh, and it's an area where countries actually compete with each other economically as well as sometimes cooperate with each other. We also have growing geopolitical competition. I think no need to remind this audience of what's happening and what's in the headlines every day. But I think, indeed, we have a more difficult time getting international cooperation, even in areas that might seem obvious, like pandemic product innovation and access. So this leads me to my third uh, key comment. So if we cannot count on um, having for, for certain strong legal arrangements, strong international rules that structure and facilitate uh, international cooperation on R&D, what, what else can we, can we do if we want to indeed see more of the kinds of projects that we've just been hearing about? And I think the good news is that alternative innovation models, as we call them, are not only possible, as we've seen in Dr. Kang's lecture, uh, they are very productive, and we've seen this across a number of other uh, disease areas for a number of other initiatives. They are very much needed. They can deliver health technologies, uh, as I mentioned, that are affordable and well adopted by design. And I believe certainly that they should be expanded and that we need not wait for uh, perfect new international rules to, uh, to do that. Why might alternative innovation models be needed? And, and here I'll, I'll try to wrap up my comments quite soon. So I, I was struck that just two weeks ago we had uh, in the UK the world's first approval of a uh, gene therapy for sickle cell disease, a debilitating disease that uh, often affects people of African descent in particular with an expected price tag of $2 million. We still don't have a price in the UK, um, but based on uh, some, some previous estimates uh, in the US context, it's expected to hover around that level. Um, at the same time, when we look at where is sickle cell disease prevalent in the world, you can see it's not only in countries like the UK or the United States, it's certainly not only in high income countries. And this is a reminder that the system that we have today that can generate such fantastic uh, biomedical advances is still not set up to develop technologies that are affordable by design, that are designed to be easy to use, that don't require, for example, sophisticated equipment in a hospital. So we absolutely still need alternative models that can build on and capture some of the amazing scientific advances we have today, like CRISPR, like CAR-T therapy, for example. But, but think about what are alternative ways to develop these products from the beginning, these technologies from the beginning, so that they are in fact going to reach people who um, need them. And I won't uh, go into detail here, but I just wanted to flag that this is one of the areas that we are currently doing research on. We are looking at uh, how uh, alternative innovation models differ from the traditional um, uh, the traditional model, which is a commercial um, market-driven model. And you can see that alternative innovation models can differ along lots of different variables. The mission, how they're funded, uh, how they uh, deal with manufacturing and distribution. There's not just one alternative alternative model, there are in fact many, many alternative models. And what we found in our research um, is that we've identified at least 130 initiatives that we would characterize as embodying in some way an alternative uh, model. It's an incomplete database, but it's an effort to try to catalog and analyze these. And what you can see in these little colorful boxes on the right is that they cluster around a certain set of diseases. So rotavirus um, arguably would fall under neglected diseases, but there's also very interesting experiments, I would say, in developing alternative innovation models for rare diseases, for antimicrobial resistance, of course, for pandemic preparedness and in other areas. Um, so let me close by just uh, flagging again my, my three main comments. We have a great opportunity with growing uh, R&D capacity in developing countries. We have, uh, unfortunately, a worrying litmus test that negotiating rules to enable this kind of cooperative um, approach 
approach to R&D uh, may not yield the results we hope for, although my fingers are still crossed. Uh, at the same time, it is certainly still possible to develop alternative innovation models that can deliver the kinds of results that we've just heard about from Dr. Kang's lecture. So with that, thank you very much. Um, I'll stop there and uh, close my slides and look forward to um, discussions with all of you. Thank you, Siri. Brilliant, brilliant, brilliant. So can I invite Professor Kang to come up, Mirren and Tom. And um, what we're going to do to start with, Tom is going to give a few reflections on what he's heard so far. And then we're going to come to questions from the audience, both physically in here and also online. So, Tom. Thanks very much. Um, well, a fantastic lecture. Thank you. And some brilliant uh, comments. Am I on? I think I'm on. Um, we, uh, I should just say that um, Sueri commented on the fact that all our, our speakers were women. So we just basically chose some brilliant people to talk. And then when we put them all on the piece of paper, we realized they were all women. And we wondered, would this be a, a, a problem or an issue? But um, uh, we, hope, we hope you'll forgive us for just focusing on great people to talk on the sub subject and not thinking too much about, uh, about their sex. Um, I, I'm, there's lots of, I know there's lots of questions coming because I'm monitoring the, uh, the chat and I know there are questions in the room. So rather than give a, a complete commentary, I thought I would just pick up on one thing uh, that you might all, all of you give a brief perspective on. And um, I guess the, the biggest lesson for me is the clearly the, you know, the initial disaster of the rotavirus vaccine development being in America and that being the end of rotavirus vaccines for, for so long until the gauntlet was picked up elsewhere and, and particularly in India. Um, but even, even then you showed us data, I think it was from Bangladesh and Vietnam, where depending on the incidence of infection, uh, you, you, I think it was four episodes versus two would be would be averted. But you know the the, the bottom line was that um, it's context specific. So it sort of made me worry slightly. Does that mean that we should be doing? Because it's clearly not practical to redo every study in every context. So I'd be interested in mm. in reflections on that, both from your your perspective and also perhaps from a. I know you're not wearing your pharmaceutical hat today, but you can give it, you know, your independent thought. And then also um, it, uh, from the, the African perspective in the sort of more global context. So maybe just a, a brief answer on that from each of you. Sure, it's about not allowing the perfect to be the enemy of the good. So the vaccines work. They don't work as well as we would like. And we know that this is likely to be environment dependent. So while we do need to work on innovations that will improve the performance and deliver better protection to children, we should use what we've got as effectively as possible. I, I totally agree with that comment. And also just to highlight that when we're talking about the impact when on Rotterdam, of rotavirus vaccines, we're mostly focusing on severe diarrhea, hospitalization, and death, but there are impacts beyond that as well. Um, so, uh, Suri, or um, Suri first, I think it was. Oh, Petro first, actually, wasn't it? And then Suri. Maybe just uh, again to, to, to endorse, but also to introduce the importance again of creating end to end research uh, cap capabilities in, in, in uh, settings where the highest burden of disease for these uh, pathogens exist. Uh, building the clinical trial capabilities also on the African continent so that we can test these vaccines in the settings where uh, it is targeted for. Um, would be very important. I, I also think that I've, I made an earlier comment about the true vaccine value assessment. If we've done that assessment in 1998 for the rotavirus uh, uh, vaccine with the perspective of Africa children um, with the highest burden of disease and death rate, we may have made a different decision on a risk benefit uh, calculation, and I think that's exa exactly what uh, Professor Kang is, is is saying in terms of you know let the good not be the enemy of of uh, of, um, of of perfect, of perfect not be the enemy of good. I'm sorry. 
Suri, do you want to give your comments on, on that question? Not in my area of expertise, thank you. <laughs> so we have a couple of questions pre-registered, so to speak, before the evening, and I want to um, put these to Professor Ken. This is from Krishna Mohan in India, uh, and uh, he had two specific asks. First of all, uh, have we reached the end of the value of oral rotavirus vaccines? Um, or is there some further distance that we have to go? Uh, and his second question was, what about inactivated rotavirus vaccines? Uh, could they play a major role in the future of preventing rotavirus disease? So is that it? <laughs> so 55% efficacy means 45% of unaddressed mm. rotavirus burden. So we do have a long way to go. We can think about strategies to improve the vaccine. We can think about strategies to improve the vaccination process. You know, is the immunization schedule the right thing? So there is a lot of work that needs to be done. And then of course, the biggest question is when you give an oral vaccine, um, it always works badly in developing countries. So does that mean we move away from oral vaccines to injectable vaccines because those perform almost equivalently in different parts of the world? The problem then is immunization schedule. How many times can you poke a baby? Yeah. Yeah. Anybody, any, any of our three speakers want to respond to that? Point about how far we have to go? Well, I, th I think and I will just very briefly, and just with my hat on again, my, my, my uh, Pharma one, the reality is we are working on, on second generation vaccine and looking yeah. at the route of, uh, of immunization with all the challenges that will bring, because yeah. we think it is a course worth fighting and getting better vaccine. Very good. And Petra is nodding, I can see that. Maybe just a comment. I think, again, here's the place for innovation where we, we, we take into account the challenges of the settings in which we, we want to, to distribute and, and, and apply these vaccines. Is there a place for, for, for maps, for other needleless applications for these vaccines? And can we start the development when we develop the second generation or the improved vaccines, also take into, into account um, that point of use, the last mile, um, and bring that innovation into, into the new development? Thank you. And inactivated rotavirus vaccines? I think inactivated rotavirus, if we take the polio example, it's possible that inactivated rotavirus vaccines might have a role to play, mm. but they have never been evaluated in humans before. So hard to tell without doing the studies. Right. Let's put your hands up in the audience here in the lecture theater if you have a question. There, please, and then the gentleman <laughs> just behind Jessamy, and then Jessamy. Well, well, thank you very much. Uh, Val Snewen here from Department of Health and Social Care. Thank you so much for a really excellent talk, and I had the privilege of joining some of the people here at the Academy of Medical Sciences roundtable earlier today, which was a really interesting discussion about a clinic about uh, the clinical uh, capacity strengthening and clinical careers pathway. And I guess I had a couple of comments. Um, one was about um, the, the, just the question, the issue that's just come up about what next for vaccines like rotavirus. And I was uh, lucky to go to a conference a week or so ago, which was the European and Developing Country Clinical Trials Partnership, EDCTP. And many of you here may know that EDCTP is a partnership that's invested really significantly in clinical trials in Sub-Saharan Africa, with, in partnership with European countries, including the UK over 20 years now, I think. And so there is a lot of clinical trial capacity um, going on, which is great. And one of the um, issues that came up there was, um, for example, around malaria vaccines. Now we have the amazing presentation of two malaria vaccines. I'm an ex-malaria, former malaria researcher, and my whole career, it feels like I've been going to meetings, hearing about that we don't have a malaria vaccine. Suddenly we have two. And what people were talking about was now we're moving, as it's not a perfect vaccine, as you were saying, don't let the, the, the imperfect get in the way. What we were hearing was how to test now mixed interventions when a lot of people have a bed net malaria, for example, and some seasonal malaria drug treatment, for example. 
So how are we testing now? How are we moving to different ways of testing vaccine efficacy in the context of all those other interventions? And I was wondering whether that is relevant for other types of vaccines like rotavirus, whether other interventions, other development interventions that are pulling people out of some of the situations where they're hitting, the, getting the hardest hit by things like rotavirus, whether that's something that we could be moving into now in the world. And to hear what you think about that on the panel. And I also happen to know that we have someone from WHO in the audience, but I don't want to put Bassi on the spot, particularly <laughs> if he's here. But you are. Is Bassi on the spot? <laughs> I'll leave it to Bassi to comment, but, but I am a little bit involved with some of the WHO and other clinical trials work now that is being catapulted really from the COVID experience. And I, so I would just say that with things like CEPI now and with other um, public-private partnerships, um, I'd love to hear what others think and also on the panel think about the comment from the, the third speaker about the role of the public sector in really pulling together to, to create innovation, as I say, which, which I think CEPI is doing. As, uh, as, as an innovation for vaccine in emerging and, and epidemic and, and, and um, pandemic vaccines. So I guess they were my comments. Before okay, let's try and deal with those. Um, let me come first of all to Professor Kang on this issue of mixed or other interventions. So actually that's exactly what happened in the rotavirus vaccine trials because we were providing so much care for the children we were aborting the severe events by instituting early treatment. So the vaccine could potentially have performed differently if we had not intervened. But again, as I said, it was a placebo controlled trial and we had a responsibility to look after the children. So I think it is going to get more complicated as we evaluate new vaccines because most of the vaccines we are dealing with now do have other interventions, whether it's masking for a respiratory infection or using uh, insecticide cream for a vector borne disease, you will have to account for those in the trials that we design and do. But you've got Peter Smith in the audience. So. <laughs> Okay, any other reflections on that particular question before we move on to the role of the public sector? Mm. Yes, Siri. Thanks very much. I, I think it's a really uh, important and, and excellent point. Um, I mean, the when we look at it's in some areas like pandemic preparedness, for example, and some of the other areas that I flagged neglected diseases, what we see is a preponderance of the investment comes from the public sector and that you also have the public sector often playing uh, a leading role in setting priorities in facilitating R&D by, for example, matchmaking, um, by providing technical support, uh, regulatory advice, et cetera. Um, this doesn't mean there are no private sector actors. You oftentimes have a very, very important role played by private companies uh, who are um, receiving uh, funding or uh, technical support or this matchmaking kind of support from, from public actors. So I think there is a lot of public-private collaboration. But what we see is that in certain areas, um, you really have a very strong uh, private sector role in driving uh, the R&D forward. Um, what we also see in the data is that in, in low and middle income countries, you have a higher proportion of clinical trials that are um, sponsored or funded by public or non-commercial entities, I should say, which can be governments, but can also be universities. Uh, research labs, uh, philanthropic groups, uh, et cetera. And I think this is a reflection of, um, it's probably a reflection of a, a number of things, but there, um, I think there's a recognition that especially when you're trying to build up that R&D capacity in the earlier stages of a national innovation system, that public investment is absolutely essential, that until you have, let's say, a, a vibrant private sector that is able to earn revenue and plow that back into R&D, you cannot get an R&D system off the ground without public investment and public leadership. And I think this is really critical today when many um, developing country governments are actually trying to do just that. Thank you very much, Sia. And Petro, you've got a lot of experience here working in Cape Town. Would you endorse that? Absolutely. And just a, a comment, if it wasn't for the South African government's investment in the national system of innovation, it would have been impossible for the teams in Cape Town 
to fast track and to pivot and develop this platform for for sharing with with, with the fifteen partners. So it is it is absolutely essential. Um, uh, I think the public private partnerships at the end, which will drive most of the of the impact um, in, in this space, because the vaccine space is, is is not an easy it's not an easy sector to to sustain, particularly if we look at at lower cost and and, and routine vaccine applications. The other comment that I, if I may, just make Suri's comment earlier. Uh, on on R and D and and investments. If we do a careful analysis, which policy for cures research has done, is over the last ten years, seventy six billion US dollars have been invested in uh, product development for uh, for for vaccines and other diseases, focusing on particular neglected diseases. Only one point nine billion of that total amount went to Africa. Uh, um, researchers or supporting research on the African continent, while the top eight, eight priorities, HIV, TB, um, malaria, were all diseases of great relevance for the African continent. So the, this, there also needs to be an assessment of where does the uh, the funding for global R and D going, and how will we ensure that we also build the essential infrastructure and capabilities in low middle income countries to fully participate um, in 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 these programs for sustainability ultimately? Can I comment on CEPI? I think CEPI again, uh, uh, Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, the Right Fund. There are so many um, enabling uh, organizations and funding. Uh, uh, entities that that supports now research and development. CEPI is quite specific. It's five pathogens. There's a, there's a good reason for for that, but they're building an ecosystem around that. And I do believe that we need these kind of initiatives to build ecosystems that will not only be for pandemic preparedness and response, but also will build the end to end capabilities um, in in low and middle income countries and at a global level. Okay, thanks. We will come back to the live audience here in the lecture theatre. We've got lots of questions online, so let yeah, me hand so, over to Tom. Thanks. So, so this one actually follows very nicely. We've just been talking about relationships between academia and public health and commercial partners. But um, we saw many collaborations between companies, directly between companies during the pandemic on COVID vaccines. But these take place between trusted partners who have the frameworks in place, regulatory, IP enforcement, etc to enable those collaborations. How do, how do we make sure there are more of these? How do we strengthen this? And that's come from somebody called Anonymous. <laughs> Mir Mirren, that, that might be one for you to start with. What, you know, the pandemic seemed to help companies. Well, I think it helped all of us work together. I remember reflecting that, uh, you know, we, we had a meeting not that long ago in Liverpool of the Pandemic Sciences mm -hmm. Network, and we'd, we'd reflected on how during the pandemic, all these academic groups had come together and worked very nicely. And we were trying to see how we could maintain it. But of course, um, it was not that difficult to work together and put all the competition aside when we all thought we were going to die of something. Um, <laughs> but once that threat moves aside, then how, how, how do we keep that kind of those links up uh, between commercial partners? I mean, it's, it's difficult. I mean, you said that there was a lot of, it's true there was a lot of collaboration, but a lot of the uh, commercial companies did a lot of the work on their own. Mm -hmm. Uh, in terms of clinical trials and, and, and everything else. Um, some collaboration existed before, small scale, and there are different models. I can speak very briefly about the model that GBGH or GSK Global Health has, which is doing R&D, the risk in products, and then partnering early on uh, with uh, other vaccine manufacturers uh, in developing countries to develop the final products and, and licensure. That's one model, it's not the only one. And, and again, there is this element we're talking that it is important that the science is also available and it's done in those countries where the, where the vaccine is gonna be manufactured, it's gonna have an impact. It's one way of doing it. Um, and perhaps it's valuable when there's, there's a st there are still shortages of uh, knowledge and, and capacity in some regions with time that should be uh, moving, entire, entire process should be moving to where the vaccine is being manufactured and needed. Thank you. Are there, are there reflections on, on that? Sure. Yeah. You know, one of the things that I've been thinking about is um, 
Academics don't understand product development. <laughs> <laughs> and we saw some screw-ups. <laughs> right? So when do you know when to hand something off? So there is a tension here. You got something like the recovery studies that were delivering absolutely amazing information at very low cost with existing products. And clearly there is a role for that to continue. Yet on the other hand, if you're looking at new products, if it is a sort of academic development and they haven't handed off at the right time, things can go badly. So how do you make a call? Who makes that call? Um, you know, one of the things that we have in the rotavirus field is looking at different vaccine products and saying, what is the time that we get the inventors to let go? <laughs> it's hard. Let's come back to some more questions. Sure. Okay, there's a gentleman right in the middle. Okay, thank you. So first of all, I want to congratulate Just, just introduce yourself to everybody. Uh, I am Marcelo Barcinski from Brazil, from the Federal University of Rio de Janeiro, and a member of the Academy of Medical Sciences here. <laughs> so Dr. Gang, I want to congratulate you for your uh, conference and for your work. And I have two questions. The first, if this eventual protection given by rotavirus uh, vaccination, which is the mechanism induced, if the mechanism is known or not. And the second one is, I read the book a couple of years ago by Dr. Brilliant, who was supposed to control, at least he says this in the book, that, uh, that control variola in India, and that the principal uh, difficulty he had was the anti-vaccine movement in India. And judged now by the anti-COVID-19, this has changed, has virtually, uh, completely changed. I would like if uh, you could comment on these uh, two questions. So, um, you know, I started my career in rotavirus looking for a correlate of protection I'm still looking, <laughs> so we don't know. We know the vaccine works, we don't know how it works. We mm. think it's antibodies, but which antibody, we don't know. Uh, the second question around, you know, anti-vaccine movements in India, we have very few. They are very vocal and sometimes very influential. So with the rotavirus vaccine story, the part that I didn't tell is how I wound up at the Supreme Court. <laughs> so, <laughs> and that was around uh, people accusing us of hiding safety events, which we didn't. We published them and that was the problem. So <laughs> yeah, it is a very small community. They tend to as everywhere, cherry pick information. And then when they relay that in their little groups, it becomes like a little echo chamber. So there are plenty of people for all kinds of vaccine. But it's interesting that the latest UNICEF survey says that India and Mexico and one other country that I'm blanking on at the moment are the only places where vaccine confidence actually went up after the pandemic. Very good. That's Thank very you. encouraging. Yeah. Let me come back so to the a, online. There's a follow on question here, but just you, you made the point that you have to do impact assessments. And um, uh, clearly that's important in, in lower and middle income countries. But also, I think that's the, why we have the, the challenges with things like measles in this country. People don't see any more the disease, so they have no idea why they're jabbing their kid. They don't, they don't see uh, the fantastic reduction in cases. And then it becomes very easy to, to develop or to be influenced by these anti-vax uh, tendencies. There's, whilst we're talking about the specifics of rotavirus, there's just a couple of questions online that we should feed in now. So one, this is coming from uh, Indrana Mukhopadhyay in Aberdeen, who has asked a fantastic talk. There's quite a lot of that, flattery. I'll, <laughs> we'll, we'll give you that She's later. She's my PhD is student. She? Okay, she there, you go. Be there you go. There you go. Well, she's, she's clearly still a fan. Um, 
she said. Could you sort out a postdoc for her? But <laughs> <laughs> the, the, the question is about um, what can be done to increase the efficacy of, of rotavirus vaccines in low income settings, and would increasing the doses help, um, as indicated by the Valor birth cohort study? Presumably that was her study, was it? But uh, where, where do we go if you do want to increase the efficacy? So we are looking at neonatal dosing. So could you give a dose at birth before the environmental enteric dysfunction comes into play? Mm -hmm. We are also looking at a booster dose so that if you give a dose with measles, does it give you increased protection in the second year of life? In slightly more experimental approaches, we are looking at what does it take to repair the gut so that you can respond better to vaccine because we know that these kids have very high levels of both infection and inflammation. Okay, back to the audience. Jessamy, you had your hand up earlier. Yes, yes. And then we'll come to... Hi, thanks so much. I'm Jessamy from The Lancet. I just wanted to um, get your perspective on the implementation side. So you've kind of asked yourself these three questions you know, does it work? Which one? Can we afford it? And then you had this you know, sort of gradual spread from state to state. And during that time, what were your lessons from an implementation perspective? Like, were there barriers that you at one point thought, this isn't going to happen? And how did you come up? How did you overcome them? And, and what, were your, what were your lessons from an implementation perspective? So let's start with vaccination cards that don't have room to enter a rotavirus vaccine dose. So how do you document that your child has actually received the vaccine? Uh, the fact that most vaccinators are told to avoid wastage. So you're supposed to have less than 10% wastage when you open a vial. So if you have a 10 dose vial, you don't open it till you have nine kids available. So implementation can definitely be a challenge, but actually with what the kind of support that Gavi has been providing for health system strengthening, for vaccine introduction, a lot of these challenges have been anticipated and are dealt with through really good training. I was surprised by the quality of the training that was delivered. Okay. I just want to come to our friend from WHO here. Thank you, yes. I'm also here because the Academy uh, kindly invited me for the, the scoping discussions on clinical research pathways. Um, my name is Vasily Morphy. I'm in the science division at WHO, which is now led by Jeremy Farrar, but previously was led by Sonia Swamiyadam. Um, I just wanted to pick out a couple of reflections on your amazing, amazing talk, Kerry, from my perspective, um, which is, for me, it was a, really highlighted a couple of key points around the, the Indian leadership. So this wouldn't, we wouldn't have got where we are without Indian leadership around innovation and across actually bringing together across the whole end to end. And part of that is domestic financing from India. We have the role of Gavi, we have the role of the international donors, but the Indians clearly have chosen as part of their domestic economic model to prioritize health R&D. Number two, you, the Indians brought in international collaboration as you needed to for your local and then supporting global needs. And this, this really just relates to a couple of the key points at the recent, um, we had a big clinical trials forum around implementation of the clinical trials resolution from the World Health Assembly, which was passed last year which is again lessons learned from COVID, how can we strengthen clinical trials? And at that forum, which Val mentioned, there were, it was really very clear, we had about 150 very, very senior clinical trialists from every disease area, cancer, cardiovascular disease, diabetes, infectious diseases, mental health. What's very, very clear is that some countries are, are racing ahead and where they are, it is often in EDCTP and in Africa, there is, there is a lot of overseas support. In other countries, it is domestic decisions that has been made in the national ecosystem to prioritize health R&D and, and clinical research, health research. So I just wondered if you have 
So, and there's only so far you can go with international donor support if there isn't that local leadership, which we see very clearly in India. You, in your lessons learned slide, what you s talked about in your talk very clearly, but you didn't actually have on your slide, was developing country manufacturers is clearly, we do not see widespread access globally for vaccines unless there are developing country manufacturers, which means we need more and more countries to you know, systematically come in with their own resources. So I just wondered if you could, there's anything you could say about how we can advance globally with more and more countries from the global south choosing, because um, people probably know, but if you just look at on a percentage figure, there are many, many countries, middle income countries that are not even contributing as a percentage of their GDP, the same percentage that high income countries are. And for sustainability, unless we have domestic support, we're not going to get there. And also, the other thing that we saw in the forum is it's really interesting the gaps in international collaboration which still exist. In Africa, we have clear investigator uh, networks around HIV, TB, malaria, and other areas. In many other parts of the world, from what we can see in Asia Pacific, in Latin America, it's quite difficult for folks to have international collaborations unless they are south-north collaborations. The, the horizontal collaborations are quite difficult. So I just wondered if anyone... Okay, let's get a couple of comments from our, from our panel on those questions. So I think the first thing about leadership and financing, uh, India has both a Ministry of Health that is responsible for the actual implementation of the immunization program, but a Ministry of Science and Technology that invests in product development. So the development of the rotavirus vaccine was... 50% funding was from the Department of Biotechnology. And that they led the program. Nobody spoke on behalf of the program that was not from the government. So when you do clinical research, I pointed out, the media is ready to attack you. So doing something with the umbrella of government over you is protection in a sense when you're moving ahead with an experiment with a new product. Mm -hmm. So that kind of scientific and leadership financial support was really important and they chose, the government chose the partners. During mm -hmm. COVID, pretty much the same thing happened. There was money put by the government towards development of vaccines in India. There were external donors as well, but the government put substantial amounts of money to develop vaccines. They developed clinical trial networks, supported them, worked with the regulators. So I think country involvement, country investment in R&D and in innovation is absolutely critical. And India should do more, but so should every other country. Yes. Any other comments from our panel here? Here? No, no. To, to, totally agree. And I think yeah. as, as um, countries increasingly also um, move out of carry support, that will become even more important. Yeah. And Suri, this is your area really, isn't it? Governance and leadership. Any comments that you had, Suri? All right, thanks very much. Just needed to unmute um, myself. I, I did want to come back on a, one or two themes um, that I think are really interesting that came up during during the discussion. And I, I fully um, support the, the comments that Dr. Kang just made. And, and uh, hi, Vasi, nice to hear your voice um, uh, about the importance of public investment and leadership, because I think that we, we will not see a significant step change in R&D capacity without that. And prior to COVID, it was really just a hand full of countries um, uh, outside of the global north that that uh, made those investments. And I think that that is now changing. So that's, that's why I think we have a really interesting opportunity. But I think if governments don't sustain that political leadership and investment, um, it, it will all uh, potentially dissipate and, and disappear in the next few years. Um, but I wanted to come back to an earlier comment about the role of academics. Uh, and sometimes indeed academics, we academics are, are much more secretive and competitive and, and non-collaborative than private firms even. I mean, there's an amazing statistic about private firms publishing clinical trial results much more quickly than 
than academics do. Um, so I think lots of things to improve in academia for sure. Uh, at the same time, I have had the privilege over the last few years when, as we've been doing research on alternative innovation models of meeting a number of really um, visionary, uh, quite inspiring academics who want to do, and I think have done in, in many cases, uh, research and development differently, oftentimes embracing open access models, for example, open uh, sharing of data, collaborating in networks, um, uh, taking funding, public funding, and, and uh, using it in creative ways to try to build access considerations early into their products. And for a number of health technologies, especially for rare diseases, for example, where you can do a clinical trial with just uh, dozens of people rather than needing thousands or tens of thousands of people, you increasingly see academics able to e either on their own or partnering with small and medium enterprises actually bring products all the way through to phase three and, and then perhaps partnering later with the manufacturer and distributor. So I just wanted to flag that academics, those who are very um, creative and I think uh, very committed to public health, who are um, interested in, in developing different ways of, of generating innovation, I think have a tremendously um, uh, tremendous potential for delivering health innovation in the future in a way that we've not um, necessarily seen in the past few decades. Thank you. Okay, very good. Uh, we've only got five minutes left, so another question online? Yeah, well, maybe we can try and take a couple of questions and a couple of brief answers and then see if we can do the same with the last questions, just short questions, short answers. This is a very quick one from Anna Hans. I don't know if that's another former. Yep. <laughs> can, uh, just on the cumulative number of deaths averted in low and middle income countries, do you have any idea what the total number is? The last estimate was about uh, 170,000, but I forget Impressive. what period yeah. it was for. Thanks. And then um, uh, uh, not two anonymous attendees, uh, and it's something we touched on earlier, but it's about the WHO Pandemic Preparedness Accord. Um, you know, ec equitable access to vaccines is key. How do we really achieve this? Does the accord uh, give us the right approach to equitable access? Now, that could be a very long answer, <laughs> um, but, you know, we heard some of it earlier, but maybe just some further reflections on that. I think it's fairly simple, you know, scarcity leads to inequity. You make enough, you can distribute it to everybody. Thank you. Very succinct. <laughs> anyone? anyone I, does anyone want to add anything equally brilliantly succinct? <laughs> well, let's let's take a few questions then. The last few questions, and we can take them in a bunch. Yeah. Let, let's take uh, there is a hand there, and then right there, and then I haven't gone this side. The gentleman yeah. over there. Uh, Rob Heidemann, uh, UCL. Um, Chair, you elegantly demonstrate how important surveillance is, particularly post introduction, both for efficacy and for for safety, yet it's often neglected, particularly in the poorest uh, uh, countries. How do, how do we get better investment and uptake of surveillance um, in uh, the places that need it? Okay, so we'll pause that. Let's take a question up there, yes. No, th th okay. yes. And then the gentleman over there. Thanks, hi, I'm Cara Hansen. I'm uh, from the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine, and I'm the director of the Global Health Research Program at NIHR. So, Professor Kang, I hate to pick on sort of in this amazing story of success and impact. I was very struck by the bit of your story, which was about the vaccine not fitting properly in the fridge. And I was thinking about that pathway and how can we shorten the pathway from discovery through to impact by working multidisciplinarily. And I guess there I'm, I'm thinking of models of innovation where you have kind of the cost effectiveness going alongside the policy impact going alongside and some of the implementation things going alongside. Are there ways that we can speed up that transition from, um, you know, from discovery through to impact? Okay, and then gentlemen. Yeah. Benny Chari and Michael Brothers. Um, thanks for the talk. And um, one question, you, you talked so much about the vaccine technology and advances. What about the host biology, including micro, uh, the microbiomes? Because you, you specifically focused on the oral vaccines and the changes in the oral vaccines efficacy across developing countries. Okay. Okay. Let's so go. three answers. So to Rob, more impact assessments in developing countries. You have to have a need. 
and you have to line up the funders. That can be very, very difficult to do. In our case, the safety argument, the fact that the trial itself was small, sold that story for us. Thorough for the product and alignment. Actually, you know, the fact that the vaccine would fit in the OPV space sounded so perfect until we got to the program and they said nothing doing. Now, we don't know if they said nothing doing because they wanted to delay introduction for another year or it really was a true need because there was OPV space that was left after we stopped the national immunization days. So sometimes it can be difficult to tease apart what drives those kinds of recommendations and decisions. But I completely agree that if we could get alignment between the producers of vaccine and the policymakers and the implementers, that would allow us to move a lot faster. It's exactly what we saw in COVID. So Benny, for microbiome, we've been looking. Other people have found signatures. We have tried really hard. And we've got some sort of signal that also seems to indicate that if you have early contamination of your gut, you don't respond well to vaccines, but there is no specific microbial signature that predicts a poor response. Any final comments from our three panelists before I hand back to Tom? Can I comment on the discovery to impact question? I think what the co what the pandemic did for us is to demonstrate that we can go from discovery to impact in a very short period of time. We should keep that learning and implement that learning and, and partly also keeping the regulatory agencies with us as we fast track. Very good. Yeah, no, I was going to raise that point, the regulators. Engagement with regulators early on is going to be mm -hmm. key as we introduce more vaccines and the only way to introduce in particular is going to be through combinations. That's going to shorten mm -hmm. our pathway. Any final comments, Siri? Uh, yes, just coming back to the pandemic accord, I, I, I just wouldn't want to give up on it quite yet. Um, I think we're we're facing lots of uh, roadblocks, but I think the key question is ultimately what governments agree to do. I mean, that's that's uh, they're, they're the ones who have the decision making power, and so the more that citizens can push their governments to make ambitious commitments to cooperate in R and D, to cooperate on access. Um, to uh, transfer technology, for example, for pandemic products, I think the stronger a pandemic accord we will we will get. Thanks very much. And now, Tom. Thank, thank you. Thanks for ending on that positive note. And um, uh, just a reminder that there's a uh, the video will be available of tonight's uh, event. So if you have colleagues who you think would benefit from hearing that brilliant talk and the fantastic discussion, do please point them in, in that direction. Uh, the article accompanying the talk uh, has been published in The Lancet, which is available from all good news agents. <laughs> and, uh, and, um, and it's free. <laughs> and uh, so we, it just remains for me to thank Cherry and Mirren and Petro and Suri, also uh, Richard for co-hosting and to The Lancet for supporting the event. Um, the Academy team for doing a great job so it makes it very easy for, for us to, to turn up and enjoy ourselves. Um, there will be uh, evaluation forms, I think hard copies for you to collect on your way out. And uh, nobody will uh, be allowed any canapes or drinks <laughs> which are next <laughs> door unless they promise mm. to fill that evaluation yes. form in tonight. And I suspect you may also be emailed it later. Um, but with that, I will close the session and, and thank you also for some great uh, questions and discussion. Thank you. Thank you.